from London. He came back to Malaysia for a second time. I think it's been quite a, an interesting past few days for me and uh, my friend Rabia because it's last time I came here, I spent three weeks in Malaysia and we got to visit many, many places here. So it was an unbelievable experience. But with this program, why I love this program so much, Be a Leader, is because you kind of uh, display your character, you kind of display your, your moral, what you believe in, and how to actually illustrate true characteristics of being a leader. Because for me, where I grew up in, uh, in London, the, the act of leadership was very little. There was far too many, there's far too little leaders which you can look up to and follow and say they are a real inspiration. They are true role models. And for me, one of the key aspects of, of uh, becoming a leader, one of the key aspects of becoming a leader is actually it's actually not just, not just having others follow you, not just having others believe in what you're doing, but also to serve them, to serve your community, to serve others and tell them, to show them the guidance, to show them the way in which certain things can be done. And for me, one of the key aspects of actually growing up in Tower Hamlet, one of the poorest communities in the entire United Kingdom, was, yeah, I wouldn't have these sort of leaders to look up to, the role models. We had these politicians, we had these uh, all the figures up in, in Tower Hamlet, but they weren't true role models, they weren't true inspiration. And to tell you my story as to why I'm here, because having grown up in Thai Hamlet, the area surrounding is very negative. A lot of negative energy surrounds that area. A lot of young people especially. Young people within my community see crime, violence, drugs, alcohol as a way forward. And for me to look around and see that, actually, is that my way of life? Because when you're living in Tower Hamlet, you're kind of stuck in this bubble. You're kind of stuck in this bubble thinking this is your world. Everything else around it doesn't matter, doesn't exist. So the people growing up within my community, that's what they did. They just lived in this bubble, lived in this zone, and thinking that's it, that's life. Including my parents, including my relatives, including my friends, my whole community. So it's very difficult to look outside of that and say, actually, what has the world got to offer me? Why am I here in this world? What is my purpose and meaning? But I never really got to understand any of that because the people I came, I come across in the uh, entire hamlets were very skeptical, skeptical of society, skeptical of life. And one of the things I learned from the people in my community was the fact that actually, if you're able to look outside the positive people, the ones who did manage to step outside, if you're able to go outside and make something happen, you'll achieve great things. But that's the only things I was told when I was young: you'll achieve great things. But how I wasn't told. And when I grew up in, in Thai Hamas, there were some of the people I looked up to were close to because the issue I face with society today is because society today, especially within the Western community, in the Western society, it teaches role model and inspiration to be those we see on TV. The figures we see on television, the celebrities like music singer, Jay-Z, Beyonce, you've got these footballers on TV, and every, yes, every young person I know looks up to them and says, I want to be like them. But are they the true role models? Are they the true inspiration? Are they the true leaders of today's world? In my personal opinion, I don't think so. I don't think so because a true leader, someone who wants to guide uh, an entire nation, someone who wants to guide an audience, for me, they have to come within. Someone you can relate to. And for me, one of my inspirational figures was my cousin. He's only a year older than me. He's only a year older than me. And as a young person, me and him growing up, we're always told that to get into business, to get into entrepreneurship, we have to have a university degree and we have to hit either 30 or 40 to get started. Before then, focus on your education, education, education. A very cultural thing. And I didn't mind that because I was still in school at the time, but he kind of broke that stereotype. He went against it. Yes, he was still in school, but he wanted to be more, more than what others told him he could be. And for me, that was huge. Because when you're, living, when you're growing up in the Bangladesh community especially, people tell you education is the only way forward in life. And I truly believe that. It is for, it's, it's a way of life, it's a way of going forward, learning and understanding new things. But I think it's not the only way. And that's what my cousin believed in. It's not the only way. There are other things you can do on top of education. Because education is just one narrow dimension, one dimensional route. You want to do multiple things. It's for different careers, different aspects. So what I did was, uh, with my cousin set up, setting up his own business at the age of 14, I thought that was completely incredible. To have a title beside your name, a managing director at the age of 14, completely blew me away. You have all these uh, role models and figures who are in their 30s and 40s with um, political titles, CEO titles, so many incredible titles, and for him to become a managing director, to have that down with CV, I thought that was just being genius at the time. Because when you see those on TV, when you see people, ordinary people, you're expecting to start business in the 30s and 40s. So what I did was I went out to my cousin. 
I took a big risk. I was still in school studying business studies, uh, math, science, uh, technology, drama. So uh, I went to my cousin. I went to my cousin, dropped a beautiful CV, and said to my cousin, Cousin, can I work for you? He gave me a job there and then, and for me, I was completely over the moon. To not just be in education, but also be employed by my cousin, who I love, I've seen as an inspiration, truly admired, for him to give me a job that was priceless. And being an ordinary young person, I had the mentality of just being an ordinary young person. When you're living in London, when you're living in, in Thai, I'm just the ordinary mindset of a young person is someone who who's laid back, who is sitting back doing nothing, thinking, expecting the world will suddenly provide them with opportunity. People in, in the UK especially, the ordinary young people like to be spoon-fed. They expect certain things to be handed on a plate to them. And I initially grew up with that sort of mentality. And when I got the job from my cousin, my role was being a production director. His company name was the Royal Dragons. I'm not sure I came up with that name. But my role was to design these calendars for teachers. The market was teachers selling calendars to teachers in school. And two weeks later, I received my first ever letter. My first ever letter from my home post, from my cousin, beautifully signed. I was pretty excited at the time, the fact that I received a letter at the age of 13. It's quite remarkable achievement. <coughs> and all it said was, Dear Samuel, is that the I was hired and fired by my own cousin at the age of 13. It was like suddenly hitting a brick wall in life and him telling me, Samuel, you are not good enough. Him telling me that I don't have the skills, I don't have the capabilities, I don't have the mental strength to be able to work for it. He slammed the door right in front of my face telling me I am not good enough and for me that hurt me so much. It hurt me so much to an extent where it brought tears to my eyes. I didn't want to do anything. I thought my life was over as a 13 year old. So for two, three weeks I had that really, I was really upset thinking you know, I'm never going to talk to him, I'm never going to go back, I don't want to go back into education, I don't want to see him. We were going to the same school. This was very upsetting for me. But I had that realization. I had that moment of realization when I thought to myself, I'm only 13 years old and I'm thinking my life is over. And the aspect of failure, the aspect of rejection, the aspect of someone telling you you're not good enough, so many people around the world give up. Don't have that can-do mentality. When somebody tells them they can't do something, they accept it. Why? For me to realize that on my own, nobody tell him, nobody came and picked me up and said, oh, it's going to be fine, you, know, you can do something else tomorrow. Nobody told me that. It was me having to learn myself and understand myself, question myself and challenge myself that actually I'm 13 years old, I've experienced the moment of rejection. For me that's been the lowest point of my life. To be told by my cousin that I'm not good enough. And I wanted to prove him wrong. I wanted to prove him wrong that in fact he's fired the most talented individual there was in London. A bit of arrogance in my mind, yes. But you need that sort of confidence. That confidence that's able to show to yourself that you're capable of doing something. So when I turned 14, I set up my first business, not to make money, not to gain fame, not for success, just to prove to my cousin that he made a mistake in fire. So I ran a web design company, I ran it for two years, I employed uh, six of my friends, actually made them directors so I didn't have to pay them a monthly wage, which was quite interesting. And uh, the question, if you throw this question at me, that do I know how to design a website, the answer is no. I ran a web design company for two years and I don't know how to design a website. So you show you don't have to be a brain box in something to be able to make something happen. It's just about knowing the right people. It's never what you know about who you know. And that for me is very, very powerful. Yeah. I employed six of my friends, made them directors straight away. And uh, our first clients, we wanted to do something different outside of school. Go into, out into the world and see what we can do. We put on our, we want to do ordinary things like putting on a suit, being an ordinary business person. We want to do something 21st century modern. As young people, as a young person, we knew we've got nothing to lose. If you're being rejected, hey, it's, it's expected. That's the sort of mentality I grew up with, having been rejected by my cousin. I learned it that way. So I went off to big banks, knocked on their door, went through the big banks, and the likes of A.B. and Amro, J.P. Morgan, Merrill Lynch, HSBC, huge investment banking companies. Just walked through the door wearing t-shirts and tracks in no tie, nothing, no shirt whatsoever. Five of the banks just grabbed us and threw us out, saying, how dare you? How dare a 14-year-old walk through our door? We have no right. But the fact that every time we got rejected, it was more fun for us, more because we thought we were being juvenile at the time. So the more we got rejected, the better it was for us. And we walked through the doors of Merrill Lynch, the sixth bank we went into. And that we just, random people just passing by, can we design your website, can we design your website? And it opened their eyes. It opened their eyes to an extent saying, wow, we've never had a 14 year old walk through our door. It shows that you're able to take a risk. It showed that you had that character in you to be able to go forward and make something happen. 
You took that step and that's how it happened. So we signed a contract with Merrill Lynch. And my cousin made around 300 ringgit in one whole academic year. In about 10 months he made 300 ringgit profit. And for me that was like being a millionaire in the present year. I didn't get any pocket money, nothing whatsoever from my parents. So for me it was like huge amounts of money. In the first two weeks having run the company, in two weeks, um, I made over 10,000 ringgit profit. And for me I thought, wow, that's a lot of money. I thought I could retire on that money. It was quite an incredible achievement. So I ran this web design company for two years, learned so much about leadership, about managing a team, about finance, about sales, understanding how to sell to people, etc. Understanding marketing, so many aspects of business I learned just through trial and error. I wasn't taught business, nobody told me what to do. Mentoring for me was very, very important as well. I had a mentor from uh, JP Morgan who supported me in everything I did. But having closed the business down at the age of 16, why I closed it? Because I thought I was losing business, because web designing became very common. And I had begun to have a passion for it as well. I only set up the company just to prove to my cousin that he made a mistake in firing. So I had closed it down. Merrill Lynch being my first client, they came back to me at the age of 16. I always believe this, when you create an opportunity for yourself, that opportunity will one day come back to you automatically at an unexpected moment. During the summer holidays, Merrill Lynch came back to me at the age of 16 and they sent me following the journey. You're born and raised in a society that is crime, violence, drugs, alcohol, as we thought, yeah, but in, whilst in school you become an entrepreneur, now that is something different. And when you stand out, when you do something outside the norm of society, society looks at you and says, actually, you want to be a part of that. Because one day you'll become this mega superstar, one day you'll achieve so much success that they can look back and say, hey, I was a part of that form of success. And that brings joy to them. So Merrill Lynch came back to me at the age of 16, presenting me with the opportunity to go to New York to learn how to trade in the stock market, which was an unbelievable experience. But I was terrified. I was terrified because I never traveled alone. I never went anywhere. The only country I'd been to previous to that was Bangladesh when I was about three years old. So I never traveled on my own. For me, it was terrifying. My mom had to push me out of bed saying, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, grab it with both hands. I flew over to New York. It was a wonderful experience working with professional traders in the Dow Jones and the New York Stock Exchange, understanding how to handle large sums of money in their millions, was working with them. I came back. I came back to London and I thought to myself, okay, I've learned so much, now let's put that learning into practice, into action. So the money I made from my web design venture, having shared it at 15% with all the six uh, directors I had, the money I made, I reinvested in, in the stock market. Made huge losses, made huge profits. I learned so much from it, but I exited just before the recession because I felt that the investment in the stock market wasn't for me. I tried something, I didn't like it, so I exited. But I learned a lot. For me, that was rewarding. Having hit the age of 17, I suddenly had, had, a, suddenly had a lot of young people approach me. A lot of young people approach me saying, Samuel, you're born and raised in this society. You, you play football with us, you go to cinemas with us. You do everything that a young ordinary person is meant to do. Yet, whilst in education you become an entrepreneur and an investor, how did you do that? And why did you do that? These questions were thrown at me constantly by young people within my community. Some would challenge me saying, you have no right to do this sort of stuff at such a young age. Parents would sometimes look at me and say, actually, no, what you're doing is wrong, you should focus on your education, especially because of the cultural background. They say, education, 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 education. Why everything else not just focus on your education? I thought to myself, yeah, I'm still in school, I'm still studying, I'm still getting good grades. But I want to do more than what just society presents me with. So having hit the age of 17, I wanted to inspire young people. I follow a belief, a philosophy, a method where to be able to achieve something, it's something I've used for the cycle of success. Inspiration. Inspiration is the fundamental step in which you gain, in which you start a career with. You need to be inspired. I had to be inspired by my cousin to get into entrepreneurship. Whichever career field which is chosen by a young person or anyone in general, you have to be inspired with it by somebody in that field. And for me, I've been age of 17, I wanted to inspire young people. Young people. My age, similar to my age, you know, just inspire them that actually, no matter the age, race, religion, culture, where you are from in society, everybody has the opportunity to be extraordinary. An extraordinary individual who can do extraordinary things. Make something happen, even if you think that nothing is there for you. And for me, at the age of 17, last three months, I spent uh, just typing away, I wrote my first book. I wrote my first book called The World at Your Feet, Turning Your Vision into Reality. A book to just inspire young people, to motivate them, to give them hints and tips on how I got started in business and how I grew motivated, why motivation is important, why inspiration is important. 
giving them certain ideas in which how they can implement to become a better person. Not necessarily to be an entrepreneur, just to help them get started in their own career field. For them to understand more about what society is presenting them with and to be a better person, a better individual. And the book, when I wrote it, when I wrote the book, I approached 40 different publishers. Four zero. And they all came back to me and rejected me, saying, you cannot publish your book. Why? For two reasons. One, because I was 17 at the time. They thought a 17 year old can't even write a book, even though I presented them with a manuscript. And the other reason was the fact they thought a young person would have come up to me and say, Sabu, can I buy your book? And they had a point there, because young people don't like to part with their money. So they did have a valid point there. But they were once again pointing that finger at me and telling me, Sabu, you are not good enough. You are not good enough. We are not going to publish your book because it won't be successful. And when any, anybody tells me I can't be successful, anybody tells me that I, I can't make something happen, they actually put a smile on my face. Because it motivates me to want to prove them wrong. So when I, uh, when I having first self published the book, and uh, I actually got me, got me involved in the motivational speaking at the age of 17. So while still in high school, studying economics, accounting, psychology, and politics, I actually spoke at 379 events across the UK, which 333 were schools, colleges, and universities, within the space of nine months to reach out to the young people, to the young people who my publishers, these publishers said, I could not reach out to. And so 42 and a half thousand copies of the book within the space of nine months, becoming a bestseller in the UK. And that was an incredible achievement. And what happened? Each and every one of those 40 publishers who rejected me then came back. Each and every one. They read about me on the paper, they read about me online, they read about, heard about me on radio, on TV, etc. They all came back to me and said, Samuel, we now want to publish your book. Why? Because I, I sold 42,500 copies, they're impressed, they now want to publish my book. The moment they said that, I just gave them their hand saying, I don't think so. Because if you didn't believe in me, why should I now believe in you? And that is the fundamental flaw in, a lot of, in the minds of a lot of people. They don't believe in youth. They don't believe in people in general. They don't give them a chance, an opportunity, until they prove themselves. Why? Why? For me, one of the key things I learned from it was the fact that even if somebody does tell you you're going to do something, it should be the best, the best form of advice they give you. Because when you prove somebody wrong, it's absolutely amazing. The feeling inside is so extraordinary. But having just rejected, now me rejecting these 40 publishers, how many people get 40 offers of publishers? Not many. And for me to reject them, I felt like I was on cloud nine. That I was untouchable. Nobody can touch me, I'm a superstar now. And suddenly I get a phone call. I get a phone call from the cousin who fired me. He gives me a phone call and said, one very important advice. That no matter how much fame, money, success you earn or achieve in life, never, ever, ever, ever be arrogant. And for me, although he's my cousin who fired me, although I hated him for many years, he came back to me with the one piece of advice that completely changed my mindset and changed my life. And for me, the power of networking is very important. I had to look for a publisher to get the book professionally published. I did a lot of networking. For me, I was on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, you can do so many networking sites and just sent out a message to 150 people all in the publishing industry. I'm several, is now 17 years old. I sold 42,500 copies of my book. I need to get it professionally published. Can you help? It's something a lot of people fear. Just simple in, in, uh, explanation of who you are, what you want to do, where you want to go, can you help? A lot of people fear asking for help. Why? I always love asking people for help because once you get connected with people, you just don't know what's inside their mind, how they're capable of, how they can support you. <coughs> so having sent out a message, yes, many people ignored me. Many people. But I had a response from 35 people. 35 people willing to give up their time for free just to help me get my book professionally published. So I was left with an opportunity because any mini mighty go to I pick. So I picked a wonderful lady who, who got me a contract in Marshall Cavendish based in Singapore. And they said your book will be published in 10 months' time. Months. So I had to wait 10 months and I thought to myself, no, time is too valuable. I may be young, I may be 17 years old at the time, but I don't want to waste time. For me, it was valuable that I did something. And for me, that's where the next phase of the cycle of success comes in. The inspiration, yes, I was inspiring these young people through my talks, through my, through my book. And now it's to provide them with the knowledge. I want to teach entrepreneurship to people. A lot of people tell me that entrepreneurship cannot be taught. Of course it can. 
you can change lives, you can actually help change people's mentality. Whether you succeed in business or not is a completely different matter. But there are certain elements of enterprise which can be taught and it's found within everybody. So I wanted to educate young people about entrepreneurship, not through boring uh, lectures, not through books, not through DVDs, but <coughs> through a game. Something they love doing, something they love playing. And I got a group of 6, 11 to 15 year olds, very, very young, 11 to 15, who had very little knowledge of business. They throw words at me, oh, what do you need in business? Sales. What do you need in business? Marketing, expenses, loans, investment. Certain things they were just throwing at me. And I was working with these young people for a period of 10 months. They'd come over to my house every single weekend just to develop a concept, just to develop an idea. And it took 10 months. The 10 months it took for the new book to be published, within that 10 months I produced this. The Entrepreneur Board Game. A business board game to educate young people about entrepreneurship. Initially when I developed it, yes, it was an educational basis, but I didn't know what potential it had. So I sent it off to a few college teachers in the UK. I sent it off to a few college teachers in the UK and suddenly in the space of 24 hours, one college teacher comes back and he was completely stunned. He was completely left inside and he just told me, wow. A game developed by young 11 to 15 year olds is now used as part of the business studies qualification in over 650 schools in the United Kingdom. And I had no clue whatsoever that it would actually be used as part of the qualification. And for me that was an incredible achievement. But for young people, aged 11 to 15, to be able to create a concept that's now teaching A-level students, now teaching GCSE students in the UK about business, about entrepreneurship, what does that say about age? Now you don't need a 40 year old mentality of business to be successful or to sh share with others or to implement with others. And in fact, age is just a number. But having produced the game, I initially was rejected by five investors because they told me your game wouldn't sell. It's too common, there's nothing extraordinary about it. And I thought to myself, no, maybe. But they were pointing that finger at me once again. They were telling me, Samuel, you are not good enough. Your product is not good enough. What did that do? Put a smile on my face. So I invested the money I made from my previous ventures into producing the game at the age of 18. Have you produced the game at the age of, uh, at the age of 18? Sent it off to a few colleges, sold to 600 people school in the UK, and now sold over 300,000 copies in 14 countries worldwide. The game I developed at the age of, at the age of 18. And not a lot of people do that. Not a lot of people have to take that risk and invest that sort of money they make. Because for me, it's all about pride. It's all about making something happen for others, creating change. And the game itself is a, is a unique concept in terms of you have your own businesses. And no business is the same. No business sets up in the, in the same amount of startup capital. So the idea of the game is to use the startup capital you're given in order to invest in your business to break from a local national to an international franchise. This is a very, very powerful game which is now used as part of the qualification. But having launched the, the board game, I'll also the launch of my second book, which is a professionally made version of the first one. So for me, that was an incredible journey. But going back a year, Going back a year when I was 17 years old, I kind of took a risk, a huge risk. Spent 3,000 ringgit on a magazine. It's my first form of promotion advertising for the book, first book I wrote. 3,000 ringgit I spent on a magazine that went out to every single university across the UK. And for six months, I had absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing for a period of six months, and I thought to myself, wow, that is 3,000 ringgit just going down the drain. But when you take a risk, something unexpected always happens. Even if you didn't want it to happen, even if you didn't know it would happen, if unexpected things happen, I got a phone call. I got a phone call from someone I would not have ever dreamt of getting a phone call from in my entire life. I got a phone call from the former First Lady of Nigeria. I have no idea how she got my number, but she gives me a phone call saying, I've read this article in this magazine. I have no idea how the magazine went from a university in the UK all the way into the hands of the former First Lady of Nigeria. That's a mystery, but she gave me a phone call, introduces herself, I actually hung up. I actually hung up the first time thinking it was a prank call. Thankfully she called again. She called again and said, you know, I've read this article in this magazine and I'm just for a really inspirational. She invited me to go over to Lagos, to go over to Abuja, to go over to Port Harcourt in Nigeria, just to inspire three and a half thousand young people who would be attending her seminar. And I thought to myself, wow, oh, traveling to Africa for the first time. My parents said, no, 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 too dangerous. You cannot go on your own. <laughs> but for me, it was a moment, it was an opportunity. I never let go of opportunities. I was scared to go to the US and I learned so much. So I am not going to let this opportunity go. I flew over to Nigeria on my own. Holding a luck, holding my luggage. After I came through the, the luggage, I holding my luggage. You know, ch ch uh, went outside the airport, 
told me that the first time I took outside the airport and looking up. And I was completely, completely shocked. The first thing I saw when I stepped outside the airport was a massive billboard with my face on it. Saying nothing else but welcome to Nigeria, Sun. I felt like a celebrity in a country I've never been to. <laughs> and for me that was an incredible rewarding moment. Just to drive every mile I drive by, I see a huge billboard with my face on it in Nigeria. And it was such a proud moment. But there was one moment which really stood out for me, which really changed my life. And for me, that is when I discovered my true passion. That is when I discovered the fact that what I'm doing has such an influence and bearing on the lives of people around the world. Having spoken in front of three and a half thousand people, many people were inspired. But there was one young person who was so inspired, he went on to write his own book. He went on to write his own book to inspire fellow Nigerians about entrepreneurship, very much similar to what I did. But, with no money whatsoever, he raised his capital just to fly over to London. Just to fly over to London, come knocking on my door, just to shake my hand and say, Sabro, you have changed my life. For a young person to go through all that trouble, just to fly over, come shake my hand, say, you have changed my life, it was priceless, it brought tears to my eyes. And it completely changed my mentality, the fact that, yeah, I'm making money, yes, I've got fame, I've got success, whatever. And when you're able to change a person's mentality from something negative to positive and completely change their life around, that in itself is a crisis. And that is when I discovered my passion. That why am I just limiting myself to the UK? I could go around the world, travel, and hopefully do the same, inspire many, many more people. So, having, having that moment of realization that what I'm saying is such a bearing on the lives of young people, especially young. But it can resonate with everyone, it's universal. I went off to, um, I set up a campaign called the Inspire One Million. Just simply a campaign called Inspire One Million with a vision. I had a vision to want to inspire at least one million people around the world. How I do, I don't know. I just wanted to travel. I just wanted to get out there, share my story, share my message, share my vision with the youth. And show to them that even if you are from a deprived community, even if you have a disability, I'm partially epileptic. Got a medical illness diagnosed with epilepsy at the age of 11. So for me, to be able to share my story that even from such a difficult background you can do extraordinary things, that was so rewarding. So the campaign itself inspired one million started last year in May. The idea is to go to 20 countries in the space of 12 months to inspire at least 1 million people. I've been to 16 countries already. 16 countries already and 12 months was eradicated because 45 countries have not jumped on board with the campaign. And each campaign, each country I visit, I do multiple tours. For example, I went to Botswana last year. When I went to Botswana, they did, I spoke at 43 events in the space of 12 days. 43 events in 12 days, did a 360 degree road trip across the entire country to reach out to youth, to reach out to young people. Young people and just change their mentality, nothing else, nothing about it's going to do specifically about entrepreneurship, specifically about business, just to change their mentality and vision, to be more optimistic, to have that belief inside them that anything is possible as long as you put your mindset correctly to it. And so far I've reached out to over 800,000 young people around the world. For me, I never thought I'd be doing that. A lot of people think that oh, you got into business, you, might, you must have huge support, huge financial support. No, I did not. I do not know anyone, my family have not had any input in what I do. Everything I've done is purely on my own with the help of people I've got connected to. Marketing, through networking, getting the support from a lot of people, that's what brought me to where I am. I didn't come knocking on the doors of Malaysia, Malaysia came to me, and that's the power of branding. For me, it was vital. It was vital to be able to, to go around the world and share my story to inspire people. And having traveled, Having traveled the world, I thought to myself, wow, what can I do in those countries? Because I don't like to just visit once and that's it. No longer, you know, you no longer see. Every country I visit, I visit multiple times, reach out to the youth I needed to reach out to. So I visited South Africa for the second time last year. I visited South Africa. I did a launched a foundation over the Teen Entrepreneurship Foundation to support youth in, in, in all, all over South, South Africa, especially in Cape Town. I launched the foundation, had so much press coverage, so much media attention that six months later, the organizers, actually a production team, saw me on TV on uh, one of the news channels, mainstream news channel, came back to me and said, Sabu, we like your character, we like what you do, we like your vision, now we're going to present you with an opportunity. Can I have your own TV series, the South African version of The Apprentice, for you to be the Donald Trump of South Africa. And for me, that completely blew me away. 
to present him with an opportunity at the age of 21 to be the Donald Trump of South Africa, that was an absolute amazing. I thought I never thought I'd be a TV host. I never thought I'd, the concept is slightly different than The Apprentice. It's for younger people, age 16 to 18, so similar to Junior Apprentice in the UK. But every single person who comes to the show, no, nobody's fired. Nobody's told they're not good enough because that's something I went through, and it's not a pleasant experience. Everybody who comes to the show gets an opportunity. The money they make per week is reinvested in their idea. How much profit they make at the end of the series, that, that amount of money is invested in their idea, so everybody becomes successful. The concept is now uh, is up and running, and with the, this TV series will be filmed in January. It's a three month, 13 week uh, TV series, and I'm really, really excited about that. So I recently just turned 22. In July, I turned 22, and for me, my new book was launched uh, called The Young Entrepreneur World. And that interviews some of the world's most influential younger people, including Rabia, who will be the next speaker. And for me, it was priceless to be able to connect with people, like minded people that have had such an influence on not only my life, but the lives of others. Because I know there's only one of me, but there are so many people like me around the world. And one of the key things I learned is the power of people in terms of hanging around with the right people who are forward thinkers, who believe in their ideas, who believe in, in other people as well. That's where you only achieve great success. And that's where true leadership comes in. That is where true leadership comes in because they support you in every angle. They may have earned more money than you, they may have done have more, more famous than you, but at the end of the day, they want to serve their community. They want to serve their people. And that to me is the act of leadership. It is not something which you which can be taught, it's something that actually people develop in time. Some people are in more great leaders than others, but it doesn't matter. If you have some character about leadership, really, that's all that, all that matters. But for me, having turned 22 and I was continuing to travel, I just recently came back from Zambia. I was invited by the, former president for the, by the first lady of Zambia. I spent a week over there, which was an unbelievable experience. Now, how I get, uh, came about doing all this stuff, you know, the, all the businesses I run, I've now got this, my second business which I launched at the age of 18, which now has a, a PR company, an events company, a marketing company, I've got the game, I've got a training program, everything to support young people entrepreneurship. So what I did was, having started traveling, having achieved so much success, I thought to myself, I need to share how I, how, how I got to where I am today. Share the, the steps that I took, you know, to gain that sort of mentality, gain that sort of vision. So with the cycle of success program I developed, I kind of came up with a concept, split it into three sections. A concept, a split it into three sections that means that no matter how you achieve success, it's broken down into these three sections. First of which is self-discovery. Self-discovery through a book I wrote called Inspiration. And it has five steps you can see. Self, belief, motivation, vision, health, and the question mark. Now, for me to be able to teach other young people about entrepreneurship, especially, they have to understand more about themselves. Because why a lot of businesses fail, why a lot of people fail in terms of their career, they keep changing career, they don't know what they want to do, is because they lack that self-discovery. They truly don't know who they are. When I point the finger at a young person and say, describe yourself, who are you, where do you want to go, what do you want to do? They pick up their hand and say, I don't know. And that's a huge issue on a global level. Young people, people in general, not just young, we're talking on a university level, everybody needs to discover themselves, what your characteristics are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. That way, you're able to learn more about yourself and you know what you're good at and you know what you can excel at. The first step of which I'm going to talk about is self-belief. And that for me was the fundamental first step. If I didn't have that belief in me to go up to my cousin and say to him, cousin, can I work for you? I wouldn't have been fired and I would not be standing right here in Malaysia right now. For me, Having that gut, that instinct, that desire to want to block my cousin, not a lot of people take those first steps. For me, belief, self-belief has something I call the seven P's. The seven P's are vital, you know, especially in my development and I share with a lot of people. The first of which is positivity. Positivity is crucial. No matter how bad the situation is, how bad of an environment you come from, how bad the society is, even if you fail, even if you are rejected, even if you are told you're not good enough, you need to have that positive mentality. If you don't, the world will just look the other way. For me, the positive mentality is what brought me to where I am today. The second P is passion. The issue I face with the world today, the issue that a lot of people face is the fact that parents especially, parents especially will tell their children, I want you to be a doctor. I want you to be a pilot. I want you to be a nurse. And the question I ask to parents is, why? Why are you enforcing something to your children? Let, their ch let the child discover what they want to do. And you support it 100%. Give your child the space, the freedom to want to achieve some form of success. Even if you think their ideas are crazy, you need to support them no matter what. Let them explore. If they don't explore, if you're enforcing your ideas because something you couldn't achieve, now you want your child to achieve, I'm sorry, that is not the way forward. Let the child discover their passion and that is the ultimate way to achieve success. The third thing is perseverance. Hard work. 
Nothing is done through just sitting back and relaxing things. One day I'm going to be given an opportunity. One day I'm just going to no, That is wrong. Perseverance is critical. Work hard. Walk is persistent on a day-by-day -day basis. You work hard on a day-by-day -day basis, yet it takes a long time. Sometimes it can take years to achieve your vision. But as long as you're working hard and you keep working hard and you're persistent, then it will, it will pay off. The next piece is purpose. Living life with meaning. Sometimes I question myself when I leave this world, what will I be remembered for? What will I be remembered for? I don't want to be this ordinary individual who came into this world and suddenly left and nobody recognizes who I am or what I've done. Living life with a purpose and a meaning and one day leaving a legacy. My Inspire One Million campaign means so much to me personally. It's a campaign I set up and I try going around the world inspiring and changing life. Yes, I love business. Yes, I love entrepreneurship, but I love my campaign more because I want to be remembered for that. So I've at least changed the lives of one million people around the world. And that for me is priceless. But in order to do that, patience is required. And that's the next thing. Six is patience. And not a lot of people have that. You need patience in your, in your mind. You need to be a patient individual because success doesn't happen just like when I, it can take years, like I said. But you only make it happen. Success only comes from the power of people. The power of people, which is the seventh thing. People. A lot of people have to think that in business especially, you need a great idea and money to succeed. I eradicated that from my mindset. Every single thing I need, every single form of success I want to achieve, any, any vision I have, I always get connected with people who can help make it happen. A lot of people ask me, you've been running multiple ventures, do you have an office, you must have a briefcase, you must have an expensive suit. No, I don't have any of that. I don't need that. I work from home. I wake up whenever I want, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 p.m. I wake up whenever I want to do what I want, how I want, the freedom that I have with it. I don't employ anyone. The people I work around the world, they all support my vision, they all love what I do, and that's why in return I give the favor back to the country. I'm trying to help inspire the people. And for me, that is priceless. The power of people is, is what changes the world, not money. Money is important to live on a day-by-day -day basis, yes, but if you think money is the only way forward, I'm sorry. So living in a completely different way. Next step is motivation. A lot of people ask me, what is motivation? Who motivated you? I tell you, my parents motivated me. They live their life, they live their, they go through struggle, they go through so much hardship in life, and I look up to them and say, actually, my parents, I don't want to live a life like you. As much as the hard work, as much as the hard work you put in to run the family on a day-by-day -day basis, what motivates me truly is the, because of the difficulties they face. I tell myself, I do not want to live a life like my parents. I want to change their lives, yes, I want to change the lives of my brothers and sisters, my family, my community, everyone, but I don't want to live a life and go through what they've gone through because of this struggle. That's what motivates me. That's what motivates me to keep me going because I look back at those moments in life and think how much difficult it was to be born and raised in that society that saw these crime, these drugs, these alcohol that's way forward, and it wasn't for me. So you have to find your form of motivation, and not a lot of people know what their true motivation is. Next is vision. When I had this vision, when I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I kept challenging myself. I kept questioning myself. Sometimes I'd walk down the street and I'd be talking to myself and a lot of people would look at me and think, what is this weirdo doing? Why is he talking? Why is he mumbling? But for me, it was one of the most important forms of learning. Important forms of learning because I kept questioning myself. Who am I? Where do I want to go? What do I want to do? Who can help me? Where is the form of support I can get? How can I achieve this success? The more questions I ask myself, the more I discover where I wanted to go. The more I discover about what I'm capable of. But it took me months, it took me, in fact, years to come up with these correct questions and actually truly really identify who I truly am. And when you know yourself, at the end of the day, you know yourself best. And when you know yourself, yourself well, you can answer those questions just like that. But the great questions you ask, you get to learn so much from yourself, which is priceless. The next is help. I mentioned this before, the power of asking for help. When I got my book professionally published, I sent out a message to 150 people and they 35 come back to me and I got my book professionally published. Why? Because I asked for help. And when it comes to the mentality of young people, young people especially, they fear asking for help. They may deny it, they may be in denial saying, actually, no, help is very, very easy to get. But they don't get connected with the right people. They often go to the people who will tell them, no, you can't do this. I'm very pessimistic. Sometimes it's about presenting yourself well. And for me, an issue I face with a lot of young people globally is, yes, they want help. They're not scared to ask for help. But when it comes to presenting yourself, they'd be using language which isn't real English. They'd be using, you know, they'd be, they'd be talking in a way that nobody can understand. And for me, that's an issue. People have to present themselves well in order to be taken seriously. Asking for help for me was vital. And then I introduced something called the uh, simple plan. 
Now for me, business, especially if I want to be an investor as well, I need to have a long-term vision. I need you to know where I'm going and aim. Have an aim in life. What I want to do. That for me is something I kept on changing, kept on changing because I want until I discovered my true passion. Which is going around the world and speaking and inspiring people. And then I had to break that down into objectives, monthly objectives, weekly, and create a to do daily to do list. And that's what keeps me on track. Keeps me on track so I don't go off, off, off the rail and you know, so I know where I'm heading towards. I set myself a time scale that by the age of 25 I'll have everything sorted. That I won't be going through a midlife crisis like many people do. That I won't be needing a job. That I'm able to just sit back on what I have and actually enjoy my life from the age of 25. And that's the sort of vision I have, that's the sort of time scale I've given myself. Work hard now, reverse the role of society. Society teaches us that once you're in the age of 21, you've got your degree now, goes go into the rat race and look for a job. Which nowadays in the majority of the countries don't, doesn't even exist. Sometimes a university degree doesn't even guarantee you a job now. So for me, it's reversing the role of society. I give myself from the age of 14 until the age of 25. That's when I work hard, as hard as I can, to achieve my will, to achieve my goals. And from then on, I live a happy, peaceful life and enjoy myself. And for me, that's the ultimate way forward. So after self-discovery, I had to teach a lot of people, especially, about personal branding. Personal branding is vital because to be presented with an opportunity, a lot of people like to be spoon fed, a lot of people like to be given that opportunity just, just on the plate. But in order to be given that opportunity, you need to work hard in order for people to recognize something. Because I tell every single person I meet, you have something inside you that the world wants. You have something inside you that the world needs. But unless you discover that for yourself, the world will not know you exist. So for me, the power of branding, it comes in five steps. Make your foundation, understanding your personal branding goal. What is your unique selling point? Having visibility is something I call a question. Now, for me, foundation-wise, how I compare that to is like a pizza. You cannot make a pizza, you cannot have a pizza made without the base. You need to work out what you stand for. Who will benefit? Who will benefit from your brand? Why, did you, why are you in this world? You are in this world because you're going to create change, you're going to make something happen and someone out there will benefit. So to understand truly about your personal brand, you need to know who are you going to benefit from. Who's going to benefit? Who are you targeting? You and yourself are a business. A lot of people know that. If you're able to create impact somehow in the world that creates positive change, you are a business and people want you. So the, brand, the brand, personal brand foundation is great. It gives you a like direction an understanding. Next is your personal branding goal. Funny thing is, a lot of people I come across, young people, I, see, I question them, what is your personal branding goal? Who do you want to be like? And the thing is, they always go back to celebrities. And they give me the wrong answer all the time. They look at celebrities on TV. They look at Justin Bieber. They look at Jay-Z. They look at Madonna. They look at whoever. On TV and say, I want to be the next Beyonce. Why? I ask them that question, why? We already have a Beyonce in this world. We don't need another one. The only person we lack is you. The character you are. The world is lacking because you have something the world wants yet you have yet, yet, yet to discover it. So when you discover that the world needs it, and when the world needs it, it comes chasing after you. So I tell a lot of people that the person you become, the individual you become, must portray you and yourself only, nobody else. But in order to do that, it, go, it coincides with the next step, the unique selling point. What is unique about you? What differentiates you? What differentiates you from the rest of the world? Because I know there are so many speakers, I know there are so many motivational speakers, I know there are so many entrepreneurs. But what differentiates me? It's because of the, the person that I am. Because I'm able to do certain certain things that are able to change the mindset of people. Change the mindset of people, believe of people. Not a lot of people can do that. I talk to a young person, give them 20 minutes of my time, and it completely opens their eyes. I don't have to tell them anything else, but I just have to say specific things that relate to them. Because a lot of people are able to relate to what I say. If you can't relate to it, I'm not here to inspire everyone. I'm not here to change lives of everyone. Other people who truly I can inspire, that's all that matters. If I can inspire just one person around the world, I'm happy that I've done my job. And not a lot of people discover their unique self. But it can take time, it can take years. A lot of people in the age of 50, 60, they don't know what's unique about them. But it's vital that you give yourself time to question yourself, to challenge yourself until you truly discover it. Next is visibility. Visibility is crucial. Because, if, for instance, Bill Gates wants to walk down the street to start to salivate people? No. It's Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft. Everybody will know. So when you create an image, like I said, I didn't come knocking on the doors of Malaysia. Malaysia came to me. Why? Because you create an image, you create a reputation, a brand that people want. You know, I had a, my own website made, I had uh, given out business card, and so many things, create a portfolio of media outlets, everything. Just to share the world, with the world that who I am and what I do, what my vision is. And when you share it with the world, may not 
not everyone will accept it, not everyone will need it, not everyone will want it. But there are people who will. I mean, there are people who will they come chasing after you at all. I've traveled the world, I've gone to so many different countries. I've, every single business venture I've done has not cost me a penny. It has not cost me a penny. I've changed the reverse the role of society. Because society, society, you're expected to spend money in your business. You're expected to gain investment from loans, etc. I did not do any of that. It's because of the power of the brand, people just want to be associated with you. And people, when people want to be associated with you, they do all they, all they can just to make you that, that, make you that star, make you that individual that the world cherishes. And that for me is the power of the personal brand. The next is the question mark. How can I build a network? That's why marketing has supported helped me so much, so powerfully around the world. Because I don't know the majority of the people I get connected to, but I know what they stand for. I know what their vision is. And when it coincides with mine, I'm happy to go up to them and ask for help, ask for support, and they're happy to help me. It works both ways. So you're able to build a network with all that 7 billion people. If you're able to get connected with as many people, you just don't know what they have that you lack, that you need. And they'll need, when they provide you that support, when you ask for that help, it's priceless. And that's why I got in touch with you. Around the world, that's why I put my book in front of my game. Every disconnected people, I don't even know who they are, but I know where they go. I know their mentality, I know their vision, because I read up on them, I do my research. And that is important. And then comes the next phase, the third phase, which is about the opportunity itself. A book I call the uh, Report Innovation. This talks about the business element. Now you've discovered yourself, now you understand more about you. You've created your personal brand, the world knows who you are. And then it comes to the business idea itself. Step 11 in overall, the 15. And a lot of people jump to step 11 before doing 1 to 10. And that's why a lot of businesses fail. That's why a lot of people fail in terms of their career. Because they just don't know who they are. They don't know what they want to do, where they want to go. So step 11, business idea. Then it's about doing your research. Then it's about planning, then your finance. Then what's something I call the question mark. Now, when you're talking about business ideas, I always tell people, we're no longer a citizen of Malaysia. We're no longer a citizen of the UK. We are a global citizen because of how we're connected. It's so easy to get connected with someone around the world, so why limit yourself to just your local community? Why limit yourself just on a national level? Why not go global from day one? It is possible. Everything I do, I do on a global basis. In fact, I do very little in the UK. Hardly anything in the UK. Because I compare it to a, a canvas. The UK, the Western community, for what I deliver, is already, this canvas is already painted. In, in, in South, Southern Africa, in South America, in, in Southeast Asia, this canvas is almost empty. It's waiting for certain things I deliver to, to come into this country. That's why, for me, it's, it, the painting can be a much more beautiful picture. It's waiting for individuals to paint that picture. And for me, that's where my business ideas come from. I always think global. I share that with a lot of people. Next is the research. The question I throw at a lot of people, and I always throw at myself, is Is your country perfect? The answer is no. Malaysia isn't perfect, the UK isn't perfect, there are so many flaws within, within the country, yet the power of being an entrepreneur is the fact that you look at these flaws, you look at these problems, and you try and find a solution. That's how the business ideas are generated. But so many people don't give themselves enough time to do the research. They come up with an idea that they think is great, but when they try and sell it to the world, the world looks the other way, because they've not done their research. For me, I have to research day in, day out to come up with ideas. My ideas aren't the greatest in the world, but I know the impact it will have. I didn't have to create a new Microsoft. I didn't have to create an app. Something simple, something innovative, something different. And that's had an impact on the lives of millions around the world. Because I did my research. And that was vital. Next is planning. Now, for me, I have mixed feelings, mixed views on this. Because I initially I did my business plan because others told me. Now we need a business plan just to gain investment, you know, investment money, to break it down into every piece just so we can money right here. So for me, why a business plan is more is just going to keep you on track. So it doesn't do anything from where you want to go with your business. And so I wrote a business plan. Now, in fact, my business plan I, I don't even use. But it's important for someone starting up in business to have a business plan. What I use now is just my daily to-do list. That keeps me on track. With my aim, just focusing on my, that's all I need. I don't need to drop a 30 page business plan. Anything I need to present to somebody is just my portfolio. That's all I need to present. Nothing too deep, nothing too, you know, too bold. It's just something simple, plain and simple that tells people who I am and what I do and what my vision is. If someone's starting in business, I always share, yes, you need a business plan. Something that tells you the company description, what you are. Because a young person can come up with an idea, it has to be broken down to a thousand pieces. For someone to present the idea to someone, I don't know your idea. For you to be able to break it down, then I get an idea of what you're talking about. It's vital for people to create business plan. And then comes finance. And this 
confuses a lot of people worldwide. Oh, I need money, I need money, I need a million ringgit to get my business idea today. Why? The question is, why, why, why? Every venture I've set up, it cost me a penny. So if I can do it growing up in that sort of environment, I'm sure everybody else can. It's just a matter of thinking big but starting small. Very, very small. My cousin, he wanted to be one of the very successful entrepreneurs. His business idea, first venture was designing 12 month calendars for GTD. Started very, very small. Now he runs his own business, he's now got to, he's made a lot of money out of it. So, if you're able to think big but start small, that's the ultimate way. The money you make, you reinvest. That way you appreciate your idea. Because if you're going up to an investor asking for a million ringgit, the investor gives you a million ringgit, and suddenly you're just splashing that cash out nowhere. You don't value it. The thing I say to a lot of people is, let me give you a million ringgit, no problem. But you also earn a million ringgit. Now which one would you value more? Same amount of money, but you value the one you make, the, you put your heart, you in your work into the, to the race, that's what you value more. Even if you even if it's the same thing, 100 million, 100 million. So for me, finance, don't succeed with this. If you're thinking of finance money straight away, that you need it, you're a bit bad data. In the 21st century, you can do business anywhere at any time because of the power of people. And a lot of people don't understand that. If you need help in developing a website, for instance, you don't need to spend 10,000, 20,000 ringgit. Know somebody who knows how to develop a website, they do it for you free. It's just about knowing you. That's very important. And the last and final step leads up to business startup. And that's it. Giving examples of different uh, industries you can go into. A lot of people want to, to become a, an entrepreneur, a business person, but in, in medicine, they want to create medicinal products. But they, they, the true passion is farming, so why not go into farming? Anything you want to do, you can. it's possible. So I give a lot of people different ideas, but I always tell them, do what you love, not what I tell you. I may tell you, you know, this is important, this is vital, this is what you have, but at the end of the day, do what you love, follow your own passion. I'm giving you wealth at the moment, use it to the best of your ability to help achieve what you want to achieve. So these are these 15 steps that help me make the person that I am today. And right now, I'm just uh, incredibly grateful to be traveling around the world and sharing my story with all of you. So I hope I'm inspired you all to bring the world into it. Thank you very much. Everybody needs motivation. And even if you were in industry for 30, 40 years, you are obviously motivated to, you know, to be there for 30, 40 years. So something must have motivated you. It's all about discovering that. Leadership comes in when you have to look up to people who have been there much longer than you, who have done extraordinary things within that same industry. And you look up to them and you think, wow, if they can do this, so can I. You may have been in there, you might be bored of it, you know, but something must give you that kick. Something must give you that sort of realization. Wow, yes, I've been working here for 30 years, but that person has been working here for 35 years. And he's happy, she's happy. They're earning a lot of money. They're, they're, they're really proud of what they're doing. So sometimes talking to them, Talking to them and getting their experiences as to why they've been in the industry for that long, why they are still happy, why it's got a smile on their face, that can motivate you enough. That can inspire you to want to say, actually, where I am is very peaceful, it's very happy, it's very engaging, it's rewarding. So sometimes you have to find your own form of inspiration. You know, I may be talking to you about you know, the leadership, I'm talking to you about inspiration, but I may not resonate with you, I may not relate to everything I say won't relate to you. But you need to find that one person or a group of people who do resonate with you. Sometimes that takes a bit of effort. You know, leadership isn't something that forms overnight. It takes time. It takes a, a lot of courage. A lot of people who look up to you, you know, a lot of people you look up to are leaders. Because you're looking up to them, you want to be like them, and you're better than them. That's the way to do it. If you're feeling deflated, if you're feeling down in an industry, maybe you need to question yourself as to why you're feeling down. A lot of people are going to a career path just for the sake of money. If you're in a career path just for the sake of money, I'm sorry, you need to look elsewhere because you haven't discovered your passion. And if you have discovered your passion, passion, you will never be unhappy in that industry. So a lot of people who are demotivated, who don't have the belief, who say they're in the job for 30, 40 years, and are now feeling unhappy and are upset. The question I think I thought to you is, why? why? Why are you unhappy in that field? Did you truly discover your passion, or did you just do it for the sake of living on a day by day basis? Passion can take time to, to discover. But when you're looking for answers from world, world leaders, and you're looking for answers from leaders around the world saying, what can you give me in order for me to be happy in my position? Well, the response I give to you is first discover yourself. Why, I answer this question, why are you unhappy in the first place? Something must pull that trigger. So if you know why you're unhappy, then you're able to do it yourself. If you can't find it, question others. How come they're still happy within those fields? What is it about them? What is it about the industry that they love that you have yet to discover? That's what it is.